Okay, it's nine o'clock now, and uh, we'd like to start our educational program of SMI conference. So first of all, welcome everyone to attend the SMI 2021 conference. And we are very happy to have you join us in this exciting conference and hope you enjoy the three-day program. And to start the conference, we will have an excellent um, short course that is taught by Dr. Hui Ling. So before Dr. Hui start, uh, Dr. Ling starts her short course, I'll give a bit introduction. So Dr. Hui Ling received her PhD degree in statistics from Iowa State University. She's currently a quant researcher at Google. Before Google, she held different roles in data sciences. She was the head of data science at Netlify, where she built and led the data science team. And she also worked as a data scientist at DuPont, where she did a broad range of predictive analytics and market research analysis. And she is the blogger of the scientistcafe.com and the 2018 program chair of ASA statistics in marketing section. Uh, Dr. Lee enjoys making analytics accessible to a broad audience, and she teaches uh, quite a few tutorials and workshops for data science practitioners. So for this short course, um, she's gonna teach the day introduction to deep learning. She has taught it at uh, major conferences like JSM and also some regional ASA conferences. And I personally attended one at JSM and really enjoyed it. She has a lot of experience, both in terms of the method as well as you know, practitioners of the data science and deep learning. So we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Hui Ling um, accept our invitation and teach the short course here at the SMI conference. Okay, so um, I'll let Dr. Ling to start. Um, just a little bit um, an introduction about the short course because of the size of the attendees. Uh, we are gonna um, basically uh, disable the video and audio during the presentation period. And then there will be some Q&A sessions during the course. And at that time, we we'll allow um, our audience to raise the questions and turn on the video and audio to ask questions. So when you do that, please try to use the raise hand option uh, in Zoom, and then we'll call out for you uh, to ask questions. And also, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can send it in the chat box. Uh, we'll be moderating that. And so, okay, so I pass the torch to Dr. Hui Ling to start a short course. Sorry, I was on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you very much for joining. Here is the website of the workshop. I already sent the link uh, just in case some people might join late. Um, I will send it again. So all the material, the slides, oh, not the right one. Um, all the material, the slides and the notebooks are on this website. Uh, we will start from uh, a very brief introduction. Um, so here's the course website again. Uh, and then um, if you want to download the slides in your local computer, you can go to this GitHub repo um, and if you have GitHub um, account, you can you can just uh, clone it. Um, if not, you can download as a zip. So all the slides will be under uh, the folder slide. Okay. So here's the schedule uh, of today. We, um, we will start from the feed forward new network, uh, and during that session, uh, we will introduce many foundational concepts of deep learning, such as uh, forward and backward propagation, gradient descent, different optimization method, activation functions, etc. Uh, those are basics for different deep learning architecture, even it's under feed forward new network, but the same idea, the concept will, will be used in also in the convolutional neural network, since it's an image processing conference. So I will, uh, I will talk in more detail um, on the basic and also uh, the convolution neural network. 
and we plan to have two 10 minutes break uh, and one is after the Fit Forward New Network. Uh, then we will be back for the hands-on. We will set up the cloud environment in date breaks uh, in the first hands-on session and use the same environment for the later sessions. We'll go through the R notebook and briefly go through the Python notebook uh, if time allows, but th this link for the Python notebook, we'll definitely talk about how to repeat the, the notebook. Um, basically, it does very similar analysis, uh, or goes through the similar process um, as in the R notebook. Um, and then we'll also provide the notebook uh, for the local machine in case there's an issue with the cloud environment uh, since that happened um, earlier this year. And for the recurrent neural network, uh, it depends on the time. If we, I will stop like about five minutes before each session so we can keep the break, uh, break as break. Uh, no, I will stop about five minutes before the, the each section. So to check if you have any questions. And then depending on the time we may go through recurrent neural network very quickly. I may not go through the hands on, um, but I will similarly point out to the uh, notebook uh, just have a brief introduction to the notebook so you can run it. All the notebooks should be able to repeat. So you can run it yourself. Uh, it's very similar. Um, as long as you go through the first notebook, the later notebook uh, can be run in a very similar way. There are some other materials. So one disclaimer, I'm by no means an expert in deep learning. So I don't do research in deep learning, more of a user of this method and have been doing um, data science for many years. Um, so if you want to go deeper into the detail of um, each topics or uh, you want a more comprehensive introduction of deep learning, you can check out Andrew uh, Andrew's introduction uh, and deep learning specialization. That's a very awesome introduction of deep learning. And also there are some uh, different specialization course that just focus on a uh, specific application. Uh, like there's one focus on natural language processing. Uh, that's one of the most used um, deep, learn deep learning application. And another one is AI for medicine. So in that course, the course one of that spe uh, specialization focus on image processing in medicine. So there's some intricacy um, related to specific application. It's a lot more detailed there. All right. Okay. Now let's move on to the feed forward neural network. Uh, that's the second uh, under slides here. So there are three types of neural network. We will start from uh, the, the basic uh, standard neural network. Um, sometimes people also call it uh, feed forward neural network um, because of the direction of the neural network and the structure. Um, Let's start from the very beginning, um, get to a little bit history of neural network, the very naive and early version, it's called perceptron. Um, in 1943, um, Matt Collock and Peets published the first concept of a simplified brain cell to understand how the biological brain works uh, to design artificial intelligence. Uh, that design is called MCP neuron. It's very similar to the neural network. Uh, the neurons are interconnected nerve cells in the brain that are involved in the processing and transmitting some kind of chemical and e electrical signals. Uh, they describe a nerve cell as a simple logic gate with binary output, uh, multiple signal arrive at the dendrite, dendrite uh, are integrated into the cell body. Uh, if, if the accumulated signal exceeds a certain threshold and an output signal is generated and, and that will be passed on um, by the axon. So the whole process is very similar to the neural network. Uh, at, in neural network, we have an activation function and it feels like the logic gate, if the signal uh, pass specific uh, threshold and then you will pass the signal to the next layer of neural network. 
So based on this early MCB, in, uh, in 1957, the first concept of the perceptual learning rule was published. Um, the algorithm learns the, the optimal weight coefficient uh, that are the multiplied with the input feature in order to make the decision of whether a neuron files or not. Uh, or not. So in a classification problem, you can see this um, in a very simple classification problem, two class. If you have two class, you note it as negative one or positive one, one for each. And then you have two features uh, to predict uh, the class of the sample. So you have a weighted average of these two features. You have W0 plus W1, X1 and W2, X2. And you, you have the um, like a linear combination of this and get ZI. Um, ZI is your signal, uh, aggregated signal. And then if the signal larger than the threshold, you will, you will um, fire, um, like you will classify it as one. If the signal uh, less than a threshold, you can say it's um, classified as negative one. And the threshold here, um, I use zero here, but you can use basically any constant number um, and just change the way you, you get the weight, but it won't. Um, it, it doesn't matter what constant number you use. It will just change uh, the W0 you will fit here. Uh, and then you use this to predict. So how, the, how do you optimize this model? It's very naive model. Um, so you can start with some random weight uh, and then you set a maximum number of epochs. What is epoch? Epoch in neural network, you use the sample multiple times. Uh, so once you use a sample one time, it's an epoch, and the second time, the second epoch. So it's basically a definition of how many times you want to use the, uh, the sample you have. So you set a maximum number of epochs of M, and for each epoch, um, you start from the first sample, uh, the first point I, and then you calculate, since you have initialized the weight, you can calculate the ZI from uh, the input X, and then um, if you check if ZI is larger than zero, you predict as one. If less than zero, you predict as negative one. And now you have your prediction. Uh, after that, you can um, update the weight by uh, those following equation. It's actually a mini version of gradient descent. Um, you basically do derivative res with respect to W0 and you, you get the de derivative is actual I, that's the actual value of uh, I, it's one or negative one and uh, minus the prediction. Um, and then you update the W0 by the previous W0 plus the learning rate multiply the gradient descent. Uh, and similarly, you can update uh, W1 and W2. And then you calculate the accuracy of the entire data set uh, to see if it meets a specific criteria after each epoch. If it meets the criteria, you stop uh, the process iteration. If it hasn't met the criteria, you continue until it meets the criteria. So this is the uh, very early version of the neural network. It's called perceptual algorithm uh, for classification problem. And this perceptual algorithm is very easy to implement in any modern programming language. Um, we have an R notebook here. You can, if you want to know in detail how uh, to code this algorithm. Um, here is an, a small example that we simulate some of the data um, of two class and implement this uh, perceptual algorithm we just mentioned uh, in R step-by-step. -step. So you can uh, check out this notebook. Um, you can run it in your local R, just copy paste the code. Um, and there are many problems with this uh, type of algorithm. First, it's a linear classification function. Um, and then um, the algorithm cannot update, uh, cannot handle nonlinear problem. And also this algorithm is too naive um, to handle any more complex problem. So then let's go uh, a little further um, to look at logistic regression as a neural network. Um, so now we have, uh, in logistic regression, we have some nonlinear feature um, in the model. So in logistic regression, uh, assuming we have M training samples, that's 
x1, y1, x is the input, y is the output, uh, and to xm, to ym. Each x1 to xm here is a vector um, because for each sample, you will have a list of features, not just one feature, selected so to have a list of feature. Um, here, each x has um, an x number of feature. So the number of features in, in rows in this, if you put it all together, you can stack it up, you can get a matrix x. Uh, it's a little counterintuitive to uh, people from stats background because we usually, as statisticians, we uh, like to notate the different number of features uh, variable as P and it's the column, right? Here's the uh, rotate, the metric ro rotate. Um, so the, the number of features are each features, each, each row, uh, and the, each column is each sample. So you have M sample, and then you have M output, that's why. And in logistic regression, we have um, linear combination of all those input uh, features, and then we plus the bias turn, uh, and then we get that accumulated signal. And then we apply an activation function. Uh, that's something new here, different from perception. We apply an activation function, and this activation function is um, often, it oftentimes is um, nonlinear function. And after we apply this activation function, we connect in logistic regression, we just connect that with the output. That's y hat, um, because it's a sigmoid function that will um, transform this, this number to be a number between zero and one. And then we, we want a way to update the model, to optimize the model, then we need a target, what to optimize. That's the loss function. So you need to measure the distance between uh, your prediction and the real value y. Uh, so that's the loss function here. Uh, it's y hat and y. And this here we use entropy. Uh, entropy is a very common loss function for categorical problem, uh, classification problem in deep learning. Uh, and then this is for one sample. If you have m sample, you need to average uh, over those m sample. Uh, then you get a cost function. I might just use loss and cost interchangeably. Um, it just, um, it's very similar thing. Cost is just an average over all the loss. Um, and then the goal is just to, the goal is to find um, the parameter value that minimize the cost uh, J, W, B here. So um, how to optimize this? It's very simple um, as mathematician, um, you will just get derivative with respect to each of these um, parameters and you update it using the derivative um, multiplier learning rate. So that's how you um, update each parameter. And now what is forward um, and backward propagation? Uh, this is, you might already heard this word um, in deep learning many times. Uh, the forward propagation is actually um, get from the input uh, all the way to the loss. So in logistic regression, we have uh, this NX input and we do a combination and then we direct connect to that uh, combination after activation function, direct connect to the output. So technically, depending on how you de define hidden layer, uh, it's not a hidden layer. The layer, it's the output layer that connected to output. So logistic regression doesn't really have hidden layer. So it's a zero hidden layer neural network. Uh, and then the, the forward propagation is the process from input um, and you calculate the accumulated signal. You apply uh, activation function and you calculate the loss. So that's, uh, that's forward and backward is the way uh, go from the loss uh, back the information forward uh, to update each parameter. So you can see the backward is you, you do derivative with respect to, uh, you use the, the differential, uh, differentiation uh, chain rule, you do derivative with respect to the activation function, and then with respect to the uh, linear combination of the signal that's Z, and then you further do derivative with respect to uh, different parameter W1 and, uh, and B1. And you update the parameter, so that's backward. So the whole optimization process is sweep uh, 
over, forward, backward, and continue until the uh, you get the the accuracy. So then, what is stochastic gradient descent? Um, so if you if you write everything out, uh, this is what you would do for this logistic regression problem. And then here we um, we use one sample each time. You might ask what's the, what's the difference between uh, stochastic gradient descent and uh, maximum likelihood estimate. Uh, it's, it's very similar, just the way you update it, maximum likelihood, you vectorize it and you use all M samples to update it. Uh, and then stochastic gradient descent, you just use one sample each time. Um, in this, with this specific cost function, um, it's, it's the same. You should get very similar results. Um, and you initialize W1 to WNX and, and B, W and B. And then you do forward, uh, you put those weight, you do a linear combination, uh, you calculate uh, all the way, you calculate the prediction and the cost. And then that you finish forward and the next step you're gonna to calculate the backward uh, and the backward where you will calculate all the derivative uh, in application, you don't you don't do the analytical form of derivative. You use numerical approximation. Um, here, since the, it's a very simple example, so we can write it out uh, the analytical form. So you do derivative with respect to um, each of the parameter w one and b w one to w and x and b, and then you update the parameter using a learning rate, mult multiply the derivative uh, and use W1 minus that product and so on and so forth. For you can update all the parameter. And after you update the parameter, you go back and it goes through the forward and backward again. We repeat the process. So it is called stochastic gradient descent where you use one sample each time and you do forward and backward update the the parameter, it's called stochastic gradient descent. We will talk about other uh, like batch and mini batch gradient descent where you use more than one sample um, to update the parameter later. So as I said, um, the logistic regression is zero hidden layer neural network. Um, and in neural network for each neuron, we call it uh, we call this linear combination and function. This is a neuron. Uh, we have we have to activate each neuron using uh, activation function. That's the nonlinear part coming in. And then, what is a one hidden layer neural network? One hidden layer is you have one more layer between the input and the output. So here is an example of one hidden layer neural network. So you have linear combination of the input and you do it four times, uh, basically. And then uh, you have four neurons on the first hidden layer, and then you connect that to the output. The output, uh, output layer uh, is not the hid a hidden layer. You directly connect to Y hat. So for a one layer neural network, if you write it out, what happened behind this, you have, uh, here you have four neurons, so you have, um, then you need to do linear combination four times uh, for the input X. X has three elements. It's a baby example. We have X1, X2, X3, three features. Um, so you do linear combination of uh, X1, X2, X3, and you, you get uh, A1, uh, you get Z1. Z1 is before you apply activation function, uh, you get Z1. And then similarly, you can get Z2, Z, Z3, and Z4. Uh, and then you apply activation function uh, on each of the Z. So when you apply activation function to neurons, it's element-wise. Uh, you just apply the same function uh, on each value uh, in that, um, in that, on that layer. Um, so then you get all the activated neurons, that's A1 to A4. And you do another random familiar combination uh, and you can get Z1 and do uh, activation function, you get A1 too. Um, and here, since we only have one layer, uh, this A12 will uh, just be the Y hat you'll have. Um, so you can see in just for one, one sample, you can vectorize 
the way you calculate neurons. So you can basically vectorize all the uh, A, A1, A1, two, three, four to be a vector of A1. That's the first layer's neuron. And since we have M samples, so we need to do all of this for M samples to calculate. If we, if we use stochastic gradient descent, we just update uh, the parameter for one sample each time. And you can do just do this and loop uh, for I from one to M, um, but it's not uh, efficient. Uh, so more often people will vectorize the sample. So you don't use just single sample each time, you use a list of a uh, vector of sample each time. Um, and then if you use all the M sample each time, that's called a uh, batch, um, batch uh, gradient descent. And then if you use, use the, all the M sample, um, you can stack it up together. So X becomes a matrix uh, and W is a matrix. So you do a similar linear combination of, of each input multiple, you do multiple linear combination. And then you do that for uh, all the samples, M samples. Um, and then A becomes a matrix. Um, and then Z2 is a, is a vector here because uh, it directly connect to Y hat. Um, so it's a one by M vector. And then uh, you do an activation function of uh, Z2, you get A2 and that's connect to Y hat. So if you vectorize this, that's what you get. So let's use an example. Um, to help you understand uh, the structure and also the dimension. Uh, it can be confusing if it's the first time um, you see it. So here is the uh, handwritten digit data, uh, image data. That's what we will do in during the hands-on session. So the data contains 70,000 handwritten label image, uh, digit image. Uh, we have 60 as training and 10,000, uh, 60,000 as training and 10,000 as testing. Uh, so each image is a 28 by 28 pixel uh, in grayscale. Um, so you can see it as just a 28 by 28 matrix. And so the, the data, how to, how to transform the data, you need to, for fit for a new network, you need to vectorize the data. Um, so as I said, the, each image is a 20 by 20. Since it's grayscale, it only have one channel. It doesn't have red, blue, uh, uh, green. It only have one 28 by 28 um, matrix. So it will be, uh, each pixel will be a number between zero to 255. Uh, and then you vectorize this uh, vec uh, matrix by row and then you can get this huge uh, vector as 28 multiplied 28. Uh, and then also for the outcome, you need to transform, uh, encode this outcome to be a dummy variable. So you will have your Y will, will have 10 column. Each column will indicate a specific digit uh, from zero to nine. So those are those things you need to do uh, to pre-process the data. Um, that's, let's look at a, a one hidden layer new network example. Uh, and then don't worry about this, uh, this activation function, new activation function. We'll talk about that uh, later. Uh, here we use the activation function called ralu. Um, so the function is, it's RZ here. The function is uh, very simple. It's basically just to, um, learn if just to uh, pick the maximal number between zero to and, and Z. Uh, if Z larger than zero, it's Z, uh, other, uh, zero otherwise. Um, so it's, it's a very simple piecewise linear model. Uh, and, then, and then we have uh, input here. The input is uh, all the digit uh, pixels, you vectorize it. So you have 28 multiplied 28, that's 784. So that's all the input, that's a vector. And then you do linear combination, you get, um, and then you do linear combination and you put uh, activation function, this ralu function on top of the linear combination Z and you get activated neuron A1, A4. So the first layer has four neurons. And then you do another round of linear combination and you get, uh, you get this Z2 here, um, and we will connect Z2 to Y hat, and you need to apply 
um, activation function here, we use softmax uh, because it's the output layer uh, and it's, um, it's, we have more than two class in this uh, example. So we'll use softmax. You can see the softmax function actually um, in transform the previous vector to be a vector uh, with each value between zero to one. And then you can think of it as a probability uh, of um, probability of the sample um, belongs to each class. So here 0 0.66 uh, is the biggest number uh, and it's corresponding to four uh, position. It's a, on the fifth position since it starts from zero. So, so it, it corresponds to four. So the prediction would be four. That's how you get uh, the prediction. And then the loss function would be just entropy since um, the, if you write all out, it will be yj uh, log yj hat uh, and j need to go from one to 10. And since in this case, uh, yj would be zero otherwise. So you end up only have y5 multiply log y5 hat um, as the, the cost. That's what you want to uh, optimize. And then in terms of the shape, um, here we have x, x input, the original input x is 28 by 28, that's a pixel, that's a uh, black and white. Um, if you have a color picture, you will have 28 by 28, usually by three. So you have three different channels. Um, and then you have uh, 60,000 samples. So the shape of input x would be 60,000 and 28 by 28, and the shape shape of output y will be 60,000 and 10 column. Uh, as I said, each column will indicate uh, each of the, of the, um, for, uh, the outcome, zero to nine, the digit. Uh, and we have four hidden units. So that's the structure of this one layer neural network. So in this case, vectorized case, the forward and backward propagation is uh, for forward, you have input x, and you calculate z, you calculate a, and then um, you have uh, another round of uh, linear combination. You have z2, and you activate it, you use, use softmax, uh, and then you have a2, and you will get that cost function. And the, what, what's the backward? Uh, the backward is the way you have to go from the cost and to update the, all the parameter, right? Uh, so you do you do derivative with respect to uh, first a two, and then you do a two to z two, um, and then similarly you can you can um, use chain rule to calculate uh, d j with respect to d a one just by uh, d j um, derivative with respect to z two and z two to a one, uh, and then you can go further from um, from Z2 to W2 uh, and B2, and you, you back propagate uh, back to from um, from Z2 to A1, and then and then you back propagate back uh, to W1 and B1, and you need to cache uh, those value I note here because you will use this uh, to calculate for next round of forward backward. So if you write everything out in its mathematical detail um, for this neural network uh, we describe here uh, with this uh, 28 by 28 image, here is what you will get. And you can use this to basically build your neural network step-by-step step from scratch by yourself. You don't need to use any um, built infrastructure and you can try to build it by yourself. Um, so the Z would be, Z1 would be a four neuron um, and we have 60 image. So you the input X is 784 by, because you, after you vectorize it, it will be 784 uh, and, and you have 60,000 image. Uh, that's the training data. And then uh, in this case, the W, that's the weight matrix, would be four by 784. 
uh, because you have four neuron on the first layer, right? And then you have four bias type, that's four by one. So you can get this Z. And then you, add, uh, you apply the activation function, that's a ReLU. Um, and then um, you basically apply ReLU to each of the element of the matrix Z1. So you basically check each element um, and, and see if that specific value is larger than zero or not. Uh, and then you get A1. And then um, you need to multiply the, uh, the matrix W2 uh, plus a bias term, you get Z2 and get A2 and get prediction. And then the derivative um, is the DZ. If you, if you do the calculation, uh, if you do the math behind it, you, you will see the, the form will be reduced to the simple and elegant format. Uh, actually, DJ, J is the cost function. Um, I, I just it just by default, um, it would be the cost function. So I didn't write DJ um, with respect to DZ here. I just I just put DZ here, but um, it will it it will reduce to this uh, elegant format of a two minus y, and then uh, DW two would be um, Z two multiply a two transpose, and you need to average over all m, and then all of this um, just. It's the math format of uh, the back propagation. You can see you go all the way and you, you calculate DW1, uh, DB1, DW2, DB2. That's what these four would be uh, what you would use for uh, updating the, the parameter. And here's the link for, um, it's a Python link. It's a Python notebook uh, that you that goes through the the infrastructure, this, this structure, um, this model here, step-by-step, step, um, it's a little, it's too, maybe the notebook is too big. Sometimes it doesn't load. You can load this notebook into Colab. Uh, if you use Colab, you can load it into Colab or you can run it in your local um, Python 2. Uh, basically, this notebook, oops. Internet is very slow. Let's close that window. We'll just let it load for a little while. Um, it um, but that notebook will go through uh, each step of this uh, from um, reading the data and preprocess process the data and um, and calculate all the forward and backward um, and update the, the parameter. So it will go through all of this step by step. Oh, yeah. Um, so this will read, you can see this notebook will read in the image data that's here and then it will uh, scale the input um, and then this is initialize the parameter. Um, initialize the parameter. Let me just copy paste this to the, if you, this is the link for the notebook. <coughs> uh, and then you initialize this parameter um, and you define activation function. We will talk about that later, more of different activation function later. Uh, and you can see value function is extreme, actually extremely simple. You basically just get the maximum value of Z1 and zero, and then you can return uh, your result. Uh, it works extremely well, um, so that's beautiful. Um, and then you define the loss and accuracy, compute cost, that's another function, you compute the cost. Um, and, and the cost is also very easy to compute. Uh, and then you have uh, forward propagation and backward propagation. We already uh, write it out as uh, in the slides. And basically you just need to implement forward propagation is very straightforward. It's just a whole bunch of um, matrix multiplication. Backward propagation can be very complicated um, depending how many layers you want to have. Uh, and especially get to the form in this case, it's, it's not that easy. You probably need some time to derive off uh, this, but if you trust the result, 
uh, that's the backward uh, equation. And then you just basically implementing those equation in this simple case is not too bad. Um, so it's basically um, some of this are, most of this are matrix modification, but some of those is, um, is element wise. So you have to be careful about this difference here. This is matrix modification, this element wise modification because of the value, uh, value function it's element-wise, activation function is element-wise. So you have uh, element-wise modification here, uh, but basically you implement backward propagation. You break it down to piece by piece, uh, and then you start to update the parameter. Uh, that's the update parameter. You can see you calculate all the DW, and then you just update it by uh, the previous W1 minus learning rate and multiply DW. And then you can start to optimize it. We also have different optimization method here in this notebook later um, that you can see how it's implemented, but we, will, we haven't talked about it yet. I hope um, in, in real application, you probably won't write things out uh, by yourself. Uh, it just help you to understand what's under the black box. Um, Um, so you can see the, the infrastructure of deep learning is in some way repetitive. So you can in a similar way stack up the, uh, the layers and then you can do ho however many layers you want um, as long as you can um, optimize it, you can get optimized uh, parameter and it works for your, um, for your application. But the computation computational cost will increase uh, as you increase adding more layers. And also you might have overfitting problem uh, when you have more layers. Um, sorry to interrupt uh, Hui. Uh, just to uh, let the attendees know, for those of you who joined a little bit late, uh, I just uh, reposted the website where Hui has all the course, you know, no notebooks and slides. So it's available in the chat box now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, all the course uh, material are here. You can see them. Some of the link uh, in the slides, I may not include that. Uh, in is just for the hands home. It's the R and Python notebook for the for the hands home session. Um, but the link for the notebook you can find in the slides. Uh, each slide, like feed for new network, so you will have the link here to get to the notebook specific notebook for this part. So now we have um, talked about logistic regression as this uh, very simple neural network and we expand from there uh, and go through a detailed one layer neural network uh, and how to do it step by step. Uh, and then we can stack it up. Um, then next gonna be, uh, we, we before we use either uh, stochastic gradient descent, which is in logistic regression problem, we use one sample each time um, to update the parameter. And then in the one layer neural network, uh, we basically use batched uh, gradient descent, which we use all the M samples. See here, we actually use all the M samples each time um, to update the parameter. We vectorize everything. Um, but in, in application, people often use something in between. It means you don't use just one and you don't use all of them because it's very hard. Uh, it's very, um, hard to compute when the data gets large um, and it takes some time to update that parameter even just one time. So they use mini batch. So uh, in mini batch gradient descent, uh, you make progress uh, without processing all the training set. You basically have a small subset of the data. Typically you can get 64 or 128 or 255 um, or 512. Um, number of samples to calculate the uh, the gradient descent and update it. So what what you do is you will get the first 128 and the second 128, and then you use all the sample. Um, so the last batch maybe uh, may have sample less than 128 because you don't always have 
uh, the number of samples is 1 to 28 times something, right? Um, and then you will, you will do this. And I said in deep learning, we have epoch. Epoch is, is when you use one of the sample uh, once. It's called one epoch. And then you go, you do a permutation. You, you, you do a permutation and then you start over again. You use the data again and again. Um, so you use different epochs. Hope you, it's clear for you. So why why people use the mini batch instead of uh, either batch or stochastic gradient descent? Um, because um, I think stochastic gradient descent um, should be very easy to comprehend because you have if you have million a million sample, it will take very long time to update. Like one sample each time, use one sample each time, just too much. Um, and it's not efficient because you didn't vectorize. So you have so, it's a huge loop. Um, and um, why not just vectorize everything uh, and then um, use matrix? Because when the data get, gets huge, vectorize everything gets very slow to calculate just for one update. Uh, and, and you can see the, the top and bottom, um, they, those are from, from the notebook I mentioned before, and that's a result from the notebook. Uh, and then it's a cost of different iterations. So the top iteration, uh, since the top, the red one use uh, batch gradient descent, which means each iteration, you use the whole M sample, the 60,000 sample uh, for each iteration. So if you do 1000 iteration, means you already use the sample 1000 times. Uh, and you can see the the loss. Um, so each after use each one, the direction uh, is very accurate, uh, more accurate than you use the last sample. But you need to use the sample so many times to get a similar accuracy than the mini batch. You see the the bottom one in the blue box. That's uh that's for the mini batch. Uh, since mini batch, you only use part of the sample each time. So you will use it. Uh, you will update the parameter many times before you even used up all the M sample. So use app, use use one epoch, that's, that's you use a sample once. And after you use the sample 10 times, you can see the, the cost decrease is already 0 0.41, uh, 0 0.41. It's like lower than uh, when you use batch gradient descent after 9,000 times. So you can see it's much more um, efficient if you using mini batch them uh, use the whole batch. You just need to use the data way more times if you use the whole batch. So the next uh, important concept. Uh, its activation function, you may already notice that all activation functions are nonlinear. Uh, since the compos uh, composition of two linear functions is still linear, so using linear activation function basically doesn't help. Uh, doesn't help to capture more information. This is why you don't see people use a linear activation function in the intermediate layer. One exception is when the output y is continuous and you may use linear activation function at the output layer. So intermediate layer and output layer, uh, they have different, um, when, when you choose activation function, uh, they have different, usually have a different way to choose activation function, a different consideration. Um, and some aspects we can consider uh, when, we, when we choose activation function, um, First is input and output range. Uh, so the function input is uh, from, since like the output layer really depends on the output, um, the response. If the response is from zero one, uh, like two classification, two class uh, problem, then you will use the sigmoid because that will transform the last uh, layer a neuron to be sub a number between zero to one. And if it's, um, if it's more than two class, multiple class uh, classification problem, then you use um, softmax uh, because you have more than two classes. So it really depends on the, the output. So you need to consider input and output range and fit that specific case. And then you also need to consider the gradient at initialization 
um, if you think about the the shape of uh, sigmoid uh, we use at the very beginning for logic regression, uh, the sigmoid function, uh, you can see the derivative is different um, when it has, if it's close to, um, if, it, if Z is very small uh, in the negative area, the derivative uh, will be very small, either very big or very small. Uh, if Z is very big or very small, the derivative will be very small. The derivative will be the biggest when Z is around zero. So and it's better to initialize the value, uh, make it uh, around zero. And so uh, you can you have bigger derivative in that case. So that's something you need to consider depending on what activation function you use, you might, uh, that might also impact the way you initialize the variable. And also gradient at extremes. Uh, this will help you detect if uh, there's a gradient vanishing problem that when when the gradient gets uh, very small, so uh, the optimization process gets slowed down uh, and, and also computational complexity. Uh, so if you use hyperbolic tangent this function, the complexity is much higher than you use ReLU uh, because you need to calculate exponential. Similarly, sigmoid function also you need to calculate exponential. Um, so it will be more expensive than others. So that's another thing you will uh, need to consider. The bad news is there's no like one activation function is the best that you use uh, for all the layers. Um, the good news is you can start with the common use case for um, many for many use cases. Uh, you might find others already develop the structure uh, a structure of the neural network. Uh, that works in their data and your data is somewhat similar, uh, you, can, you can try their model and what they use first and go from there. So we already have like deep learning has very awesome, uh, amazing community, very supportive and, and people will share, um, people in general will share their code and in uh, their neural network structure and their code, the result in GitHub. Um, so people build on each other's work. So that's amazing part of the deep learning community. So these are the major, um, most common activation function. Uh, and then we already talked about the sigmoid function. Uh, it's both sigmoid function and this hyperbolic tangent function. They are S shape. Uh, they will, uh, they have an uh, output the sigmoid function has the output between uh, zero to one. And you can see the, the gradient vanish uh, when Z gets, absolute value of Z gets big away from zero. So even the fact that uh, the sigmoid is differentiable that might provide some convenience uh, in terms of bad propagation, but the decreasing shape can cause neural network to get stuck at the training time. Um, that's why now you don't really see people use sigmoid function in the intermediate layer, uh, only for the last layer if it's a two class uh, problem. So the output layer, you will see people use sigmoid function. Uh, hyperbolic tangent function, um, this is another uh, S-shape function. Um, it works better than the sigmoid function as the intermediate layer, but it has a very similar problem of uh, vanishing gradient when Z is um, in extreme. This function cross point uh, zero and zero. So that's probably why it works a little better than sigmoid function because in new network, you will see people usually will centralize them. Uh, people sometimes centralize and, and uh, standardize the, the input. Uh, so since the the, this function in some way would centralize things around zero uh, because it, it will uh, transform all the data between negative one and two one. Um, but still it's not commonly used in as intermediate layer uh, activation function anymore. Um, and it's used the most in um, recurrent neural network as intermediate layer activation function. Uh, to polarize the result. And then the 
rectified linear unit function. That's what we used in the step-by-step -step neural network, uh, one layer neural network. This is the most common one. It's a groundbreaking um, advancement in, in deep learning. Um, it's extremely simple, but it works very well. Um, and then for the, for the uh, ralu function, it's even it's unlikely, but sometimes it could happen that uh, if z is all zero, well, it's unlikely that all the neurons are zero, but if it happens, um, it will cause problem um, because basically the linear combination for the next layer will be all zero and then you just don't get anything. Um, so that's why uh, sometimes people use this uh, leaky uh, raru. Uh, basically just for z less than zero, you multiply z with a very, very small number, maybe 0 0.001 like that. Uh, so people usually use 0 0.01 uh, to prevent that from happening when z is all zero. Um, and then the Laru function is nonlinear, uh, even it's simple, but it's still a nonlinear function. And then it has the, um, very easy de derivative when z is larger than uh, for the normal value when z is larger than zero the derivative is one uh, when z is less than zero de derivative is zero or when z equals to zero you just define it it doesn't matter you can define it with either zero or one like let me see if i can find the derivative of value yeah ralu de derivative um, in application basically you can say um, positive uh, z larger than one, you uh, return z one. And in zero, it doesn't matter. Um, like here, I just define it as uh, zero. So you can define this point uh, as zero or one. So um, to to sum up for intermediate layer, uh, value is usually a good choice. If you don't know what to choose, uh, then start with value. And leaky value usually works better than value, but uh, it's not used as much in practice um, because it's unlikely to have, um, in many cases, um, to have all z to be zero. Um, so either one works fine. Also, people usually, if you use uh, leaky value, uh, people usually use a equals 0 0.01. Um, and hyperbolic tangent uh, is used sometimes, uh, especially in recurrent neural network, uh, but you really nearly never see people use sigmoid function as intermediate layer activation function anymore. And for the, uh, if it's the last layer, uh, which connects to the output, uh, it really depends on the shape of the output. Uh, if the output is binary um, classification and then you use um, sigmoid, um, if it's the output is more than like two class uh, classification, use softmax. Uh, if it's continuous, you just use y equals to x. And then you can see that new network can easily get large and have so many layers um, and they will have problem with uh, overfitting. There are different ways to handle overfitting in your network. One way is to use regularization. Uh, this is just the statistician, what we uh, statistician are familiar with. You either use L1 penalty or use L2 penalty. And you have a tuning parameter lambda to control how much uh, penalty you want to use. And another a more common way uh, in your network for um, handling overfitting is to use dropout. Uh, so basically for a standard neural network fully connected, uh, you will have all this linear combination. Um, and then um, after applying dropout, basically you have you define a specific uh, percentage, like you drop 0.5% of the neurons. Uh, and, then, and then you can randomly pick and choose the neuron you want to drop, uh, or, or you can randomly uh, pick and choose based on the percentage 
uh, the dropout rate, uh, and then um, you just don't use that neuron uh, on that layer and move forward, skip those neurons. Um, mm -hmm. Note that here, you, you don't use that neuron on this path, doesn't mean uh, you won't use that neuron in the next uh, mini batch. So basically just each, each, each time it will randomly pick different neuron. Uh, in general, you still use all the neurons uh, in your neural network. So in general, dealing with overfitting, there are the, the reason that uh, there is overfitting is due to the size of a neural network. Uh, the total number of parameters can be huge. And also it can be due to the, uh, the training data, use the training data too many times. As I said, we use uh, the e different epochs. Uh, each epoch means you use all the training data once and you use the data repeatedly, so that can cause overfitting. Uh, solution for overfitting um, due to the size of the neural network, usually you will use either uh, regularization, use L1, L2 penalty, or use dropout. You randomly drop a percentage of nodes each layer. Um, it's very similar to um, random forest where you only pick and choose a portion of the uh, parameter uh, when you when you build the tree when you, when you do the split. But in general, you use all of the uh, variables, so that's a very similar idea. A uh, um, solution for the overfitting due to using too many epochs, uh, you can you can use the cross validation. Um, to decide the number of epoch you want to use. Uh, you can have plot the training accuracy and you, you plot the testing accuracy. When you see the testing accuracy drop, uh, that's when you will know you shouldn't add more epoch. So in the, in the history of the deep learning, uh, researchers proposed different optimization algorithm and showed that they worked well in specific scenario. Um, it's just like a lot of other things in deep learning. We have uh, like different paper on how to search for the right structure uh, and activation function. They're just different proposals, but um, there are some work for work well in specific scenario, but there's no, um, single one that works universally well. Um, it's the same case for optimization uh, method. It doesn't gener gen generalize well to a wide range of neural networks. So you will need to try different optimizers in your application. Um, we'll introduce the commonly used op optimizer here. And they are based on something called exponential weighted average. Uh, and for, for more learning, uh, this notebook, has the implementation of the three optimization method uh, we mentioned, we mentioned in the site, uh, in the sites. And then based on this same um, data, you can pick and choose what, what optimization method you want to use. You can choose different cumin parameter, different weight, adjust different weight. Um, you can address it a certain way to make it more like a, um, a simple average. Uh, and then you can see how that will give a different result, how that impact the, the um, how that impact the, the speed in this specific uh, data. What make it tricky though is in deep learning, it, it may work certain way on this specific data, doesn't guarantee it works the same way if you have a new data set. Um, so I think that might be something um, mathematician or statistician can do more research on um, um, to build more theoretical foundation um, behind it to understand more of why it happens um, a certain way. Yeah, um, so the exponential weighted average. Um, so for the optimization method, uh, you basically need to try different optimizers in your application. Um, to find which one works for you the best. But all of this are based on this exponential weighted average idea. So the idea of exponential weighted is if, assuming you have this um, different temperature, a series of temperature, uh, and the weighted average is defined as 
um, you have beta. Um, so use the previous t minus one uh, multiply beta plus uh, one minus beta multiply theta t. Uh, you start with um, v zero equals zero. Um, and then for v one, you calculate v one as beta multiply v zero and plus one minus beta theta, theta one. Uh, and then you're moving forward. Uh, so you can, when beta is large, you basically average over a long period of days before. Um, so approximately you average over uh, one divided, one divide uh, one minus beta days before. So if beta equals 0 0.95, you basically average approximately every 20 days uh, of date uh, temperature. Uh, so if beta equals 0 0.8, which approximates five days average. Uh, and also you can see at the beginning, um, it actually is very way off because V0 is set to be zero. So it's not a normal average. It's far away from a normal average. So people use a way to correct uh, the exponential weighted average. So they use, they don't directly use VT, they use VT divided by uh, a number um, to adjust the, the, uh, the value to make it ramp up faster. So in this case, if it beta equals 0 0.95, um, for the, the left column is without correction, Without correction, you can see it's only a very small portion of um, theta one and theta two. Uh, and you need to wait until it moves over um, because it approximately uh, moves over 20 days. So you basically need to see a better blending uh, after 20 days. Uh, it, with correction, you can make the blending faster. Uh, and the beta here can, uh, used to, can be used to adjust uh, the rate a little. And you can see that with correction and without correction on, on different beta, uh, the larger the beta means you average over a longer period of, of time, the longer history. The smaller the beta, you are basically average the previous couple. Um, so if beta equals 0 0.5, you are looking at the previous two steps of, of um, value. So why we want to use this average, why not just use the derivative directly instead we want to use the, um, we want to use the some sort of average um, in, in this case, um, some intuition behind the moving average is if Assuming you have two parameter B and W, um, and currently you are here, the blue dot here, right? Uh, and your goal is to get to the red dot. Um, and then in, at this position, the blue dot is actually very, um, very close to uh, the red in the direction of B. And, the, and it's very far away uh, in terms of the direction of W, much further away you know, in the direction of W horizontal. And what you want at this point is to move smaller step um, on, uh, on the, in, towards the direction of B, but you want to move uh, further or faster towards W. You basically want to oscillate around B and move towards W. Um, and if you think about derivative, when you are close to the, when you are close to the um, optimal value in terms of B, it's likely that derivative will be around positive, negative, positive, negative, that tipping point back and forward. So it's basically try to prevent it. If you average over some uh, previous steps number, it tries to prevent it from um, going too far. If you average over a series of positive and negative number, it basically cancel out. And then you won't move too far away, won't jump too far away. Um, but in terms of W, it's more likely the previous many steps are all on one side of, of the, uh, the tipping point. And it can be either all negative or all positive. And so the average is more likely to keep on being one sign and one direction. 
Um, there's no guarantees because you really don't know uh, what the shape would be like, uh, right? Maybe uh, around this B, you have multiple like local minimal or local maximal. So you really cannot control. That's why there's this no guarantee. Uh, it just helps um, to stabilize things. Also in deep learning, we use mini batch uh, gradient descent. Um, so that, so each time you just use a subset of the sample um, to update the parameter. So direction of the update has some variance. Uh, this is also a way to try to stabilize the variance. All these three different, um, three different method are the, the common goal is to stabilize the uh, variance and to somehow to tune the uh, learning rate. So make it adapt to a specific local learning rate um, by, by adjusting, uh, the, by using moving average. So that's the idea of these three uh, different. So for momentum, um, instead of using DW, you use VDW. Uh, so it's relative straightforward. And for, um, D, for B, instead of using DB, you just use VB and this, the V, here are the moving average of the original sequence of value. For R RMS prop, uh, you basically calculate the uh, SDW. Uh, it's another moving average. You average the magnitude of, uh, because you use W square, you, you average the magnitude of the, of the uh, W and B, you ignore the, the sign, so you don't let it cancel out. Basically, you want to make sure when the magnitude is very big, uh, you tune down the learning rate. When the magnitude is small, um, you tune up the, the learning rate. Uh, so this is another way to tune the learning rate. So you divide it by square root of S. And adaptive mo moment, moment estimation, we usually call it atom, uh, this, this actually tune both. It tunes the, um, the momentum and also you also tune the, uh, the magnitude. You also divide it by the magnitude. So when the magnitude is large, uh, the learning rate is smaller because basically learning rate is divided by the magnitude. Uh, and when the magnitude is small, uh, you, you um, increase the, learning rate in some way. And then you also have this VDW and VDB. That's basically will make the sign that decide the sign. So you control both the sign, the direction and the magnitude uh, basically. So momentum is more of about the direction. And then Armas prop is try to control the, the uh, magnitude, how big. And then um, Adam combines these two. All right, I think that's most of the um, basic concept of fit forward neural network. Most of this uh, will carry on to the convolutional neural network. Um, and we, during a hands-on session, we will use the date break community edition. Uh, the reason we choose date breaks is because then in that way we can control the version of different package because date breaks has different runtime. Uh, by choosing a specific runtime, we can control, make sure everyone use the same uh, version of different R and Python package, and then make sure you can repeat the notebook. But in case the, um, in case the cloud doesn't work, sometimes the server can be down. Uh, it happened last time, um, last month when we taught this course. So uh, in case that happened, you can also use the local notebook. We have a local notebook uh, here. So for each hands on, we have the date breaks notebook. We have a local notebook and also Python notebook. Uh, so for the local notebook, you could run it locally. Uh, just need to set up the Python um, correctly. So you can you can have run into some problems. I um, 
this I ran into some problems and I did some search. So uh, it's solution for the the problem I had. Uh, it seems pretty common. Um, so if you had a similar problem, uh, if a similar problem, you can refer to this. Try to uh, troubleshoot uh, the problem to make sure you install the right version of of Python and R. Because Keras package basically is an interface to the Python uh, Keras and, and TensorFlow. Um, so you need to install Python as well in the backend. All right, I think we can have a 10 minutes break and then we will go back after 10 minutes. Yes, so you will go to your workspace uh, and click user and you will see your username, uh, get into your space and you go, there's a point down error. Uh, and then you go import. And then you pick URL. And then you go to this website, um, you copy paste the URL of the, you do import, let me send everyone the URL. And you import. Yep. Since I already imported, so. I'll cancel. And then you can click. It's better to click just run all because one cell depends on the other. So you just run all cells in this notebook. You click run all cells in this notebook. It will start to run. Okay. I hope everyone is in the In the notebook now. So the, as I said, Keras will um, actually use the Python, the R Keras package use the Python Keras package, which use the TensorFlow um, as the backend. So you need to first install uh, R Keras package. It takes some time to install. Um, and then and then you do library, you, you also need to install Keras. Uh, this function will install the backend Python package. Um, so this data set, uh, the help written digit data set um, is already in the, in the package. So you can just use data set means um, to load the, the data. So you can see it loads the data. So you're already familiar with the data because when we go through the feedboard new network, we already introduced the data. It's a handwritten digit. The training set has 60,000 image with 20 by, 28 by 28. Um, it's a 28 by 28 pixel grayscale image. So each pixel would be a number between zero to 255. So it's a 28 by 28 matrix. A testing set would be 10,000 image uh, and you have the response variable. That's the, the label of the digit, can read in digit. So you can see the structure of the data would be uh, input the training data, train or uh, X would be uh, one to 60,000 and each each one, each input, well, yeah, each input will be uh, 20 by 28 matrix and Y is uh, one to 6,000. This is before you pre-process it. You need to pre-process it. Uh, why? Right now, it's just the digit, the real digit number uh, outcome. You can see it's 504. It's not a dummy variable yet. Um, and testing is the same thing. So first you will need to read, uh, you will need to get the training data and, and save it as an object. Uh, and then testing data, you save it as an object. Uh, and you can see the it just it's the same. Basically, you save it as different object. So you can see the um. So you can save all the object to um 
separate it out to be X train, Y train, X test, Y test. Um, and then you can see the image, uh, this cell basically just, you assign any of the image and then uh, you get the input matrix um, and you apply. So you have to rotate it. It's because the way it is saved is rotated. You, you always need to rotate the, the matrix to see it as the right uh, position direction. And you can change the number um, to, like, to see another image. Uh -oh. Incorrect number of dimension. It's very strange. No, uh, I don't know what's going on here. You should be able to change the number and plot it again. You know, if you need to go all the way. Yeah, oh, uh, you can change the, because I already pre-processed the, you can plot different number um, image. And then when you visualize the input matrix, it's uh, each one is a zero to 255 uh, pixel value. And then you need to pre-process the data. Um, the first is you have to vectorize uh, the image to be an array because it's not convolutional neural network. We're not using convolutional neural network. So it doesn't handle um, the matrix. So you need to vectorize it. So this basically uh, vectorize the result um, and then vectorize the input and then you need to rescale um, to be between zero to one. Um, it actually make a big difference. Uh, you rescale it or you don't rescale it. Um, the model accuracy will be different because rescale it will help um, the uh, the grid, uh, the propagation process, the optimization process. So you need to rescale it. Um, and then after. After this, uh, you can see the new data shape change to be um, one to 60,000 and you have 784 features. And then you need to pre-process the, the outcome variable. Uh, you have to make the outcome variable to be a categorical, uh, the dummy variable, 10 different dummy variable. The current outcome variable is, uh, if you remember the current outcome variable, it's just a, a digit number, uh, like 60,000 and digit number from zero to nine. And then you need to make it dummy variable. So you have 10 columns, right? You have 60,000 image and you have 10 columns. Each column will indicate uh, that image, the, if that image is specific um, digit. So then you re, encode this uh, to be dummy variable, then you can start to fit model. So in CARES, uh, it's very easy to fit um, the model if you know what layer you want and how many unit you want. Like if you know an existing model, you want to not too complicated, you want to replicate the, this model uh, and then you can just basically stack up those layers uh, in this model you will have, um, first you need to init initiate a sequential model object. So it's a DNN model. And then you start to uh, stack up all the layers. Uh, the first layer is dense layer. So you'll say you have 259 units. That's the neurons you want. Uh, and activation function use ReLU and input shape. Uh, first layer, you need to specify input shape. That's 784. Um, yep, that's 784. Uh, and, then, and then you have a dropout uh, rate is 0 0.4. So it will randomly drop out uh, the percentage of, of uh, 0.4% of, of the neuron um, in each iteration. And then um, you stack another layer that is another dense layer, it's 128, and use activation function value 
okay? And then you, you set another dropout uh, and then you need, and you add another dense layer, that's 46 uh, neuron, and then use value uh, and drop out again. You note the last layer, uh, that's an important one. The last layer, you use unit 10. You can't, so for the previous layer, you can change, you can try to increase the number of units, see how it works or decrease the number of units. You can do your own magic uh, to change this. But for the last layer, you need to use 10 units because that's the shape. You have to match the shape of Y. Uh, y here has 10 columns. That's your category, number of category. So you need to use 10 units and then the activation function is softmax for this one. So then after um, you run this, you basically um, already initialize this model uh, and this model has four layers. First layer has 255 nodes, second layer 128 and third layer 64, last layer 10. Dropout doesn't, drop out doesn't count um, as a um, legitimate layer. Uh, it's basically a regulation. Uh, try to prevent overfitting, but it's not a layer. And the activation function for the first three layers are all value, and the last layer is softmax because you need to connect it to the um, the final result, the outcome. And you can get the model detail using a summary, use model summary. Up until now, you haven't started feeding the model yet. You basically define the model. Uh, up until now, we haven't um, we haven't fit any model yet. Uh, we just basically define the model. You can see the number of parameter in this. This is a very small, very very small uh, example. We have total parameter two hundred forty two hundred forty two thousand uh, about two hundred forty three thousand here. Um, and if you if you if you remember the number of image, we only have sixty thousand. So you can easily pass. Uh, number of parameter will pass the number of samples. Now you start to compile uh, the model. So you already, so far the DNN model, you already defined the DNN model here. So you're already defined some of the model structure and you need to further define what's the loss function you want to use. Uh, categorical entropy is uh, it's a very common one. An optimizer here, we use uh, our RMS prop. Uh, if you remember, RMS prop will adjust the direction and also adjust the learning rate, the magnitude you want to learn. Um, so it's a combination of the two. You can also change different optimizer um, to see how that can impact the uh, conversion. And if you want to see even more in more detail, you can go to the step-by-step. -step. Uh, it has different optimi optimizer there and you can use different optimizer. You can see the detail um, cost after each epoch. You can tune it the way you want um, to see how that impact the, the optimization process. And here you compile the model. So the DN model include all the structure and you do com compile and you add in more information like loss function what optimizer you want to use and the metrics um, you use accuracy here. You want to show, it will show you the accuracy. And then once you have defined all of this, um, you can start to fit the model. And when you fit the model, uh, you need to specify more things. You can see there are so many different um, tuning, hyperparameter that you need to decide. Um, and then you need to define how many epochs. You can uh, have 20 or 50 epochs, um, things it takes time to run. I put 15 here. Um, and then the batch size, uh, I use 128. That's a typical batch size, uh, mini batch size, more specific. Uh, and validation split is 0 0.2. Uh, this is the validation split in training data. It's not using the testing. Testing data is just for testing. This is just used to train model. Uh, they use validation split because you need to uh, apply on uh, the validation data um, to know the accuracy. 
So then after this, you will start to fit the model and it will start to see the, it just shows you the process of fitting the model. So um, you can see how it changed after each epoch. Uh, it will see you how, show you how it changed after each epoch, the loss function. Um, and then this doesn't take too long to run, uh, less than one minute. Actually installing the, the package take longer than running this. And also it's a very simple model. So it doesn't take too much to run. It will take longer when you do RN and, and the uh, CNR. And then you can see the structure of the DN history. Um, and you can plot the DN history. So you can see the loss and the validation loss. The loss is the loss in the training data. Uh, validation loss in the, it's in the validation data. That's the 20% you left out. In your training data. Um, so this is the accuracy. So you can see about around 11 epoch, around there. Uh, if you look at the loss, it's about 10, about 10 or 11, maybe around 10, you will start to see the loss increase again in the validation set. So uh, you might just choose 10 or 11 epoch instead of using 15. Uh, if you add more epoch, you could see a further trend. And can validation, the accuracy, you probably can see that accuracy on validation um, can be higher than um, accuracy in the, in the uh, used to train the model. Um, it's not necessary though. In general, you will see the trend, but in specific sample, you could see validation accuracy higher because it's random sample. And then you can use that to predict um, the test data. You, you didn't, so far, uh, we didn't use the text data uh, to build the model. Uh, and then you can, you, you can use the DN model object. So when you run this, even you can see that that can be something confusing. You don't see anything assigned to this. Um, you don't see anything assigned to this DN model, but once you run each of this cell, uh, it actually gets attached to the, the object DN model. So um, the DN model has more information than the, the beginning at the, at the beginning. So here you can use the model you have uh, to evaluate the test data. So you can see the accuracy is 0 0.97, uh, about 0 0.8 or uh, 0.98 on this testing data. And you can also check the prediction, top of the prediction. And you can also check some of the image that um, that's misclassified. Let's see this image. So this is an image that uh, for digit seven and wrongly predicted as nine. Um, I wouldn't blame the computer if it's actually very confusing. It, it looks like nine in some way, so. And you can try to look for a different image. So this is another one. It's image for digit A. It's wrongly predicted as nine, huh? This is more like an A um, to humans. The previous one is more confusing, but this one is, seems more like a mistake. Uh, to predict S9. So yeah, that's the um, how to use R um, to implement this neural network using Keras package. Here's the Python link for the Python notebook. Um, as soon as you have your collab, um, if you, as soon as you have uh, the a Google account. Um, and then you should be able to 
open in Colab. You just log into your Google account. So here's my Google account, and then I log into my Google account, um, and then you can open it in Colab, and it will load automatically load it into your Colab. Uh, and then you can just run like like the way you run uh, the way you run this. Um, they breaks notebook. The good thing about this is you don't need to set up a cluster. Once you start to run, it will automatically set up the cluster for you. Yeah. And you don't need to install those um, like the package as you did in, in um, our notebook because many of those packages are by default there. So. All right. Um, Hope everyone is back. We'll get to the, the current new network. I think that's most of people are interested in uh, since it's the main type of um, network that that's used for image data, image processing. So um, there are some challenges using feed for a new network. Um, it's a foundation. So the concept we just introduced we will use that in convolutional neural network and convolutional neural network will use the feed forward fully connected layer uh, as part of it, but it, it has more than that. Um, so there are some challenges using um, the previous feed forward neural network to solve the computer vision problem. Uh, one of the challenges is that the input can get really big after uh, you vectorize image array. Here we have 28 by 28. And after we vectorize it, it's like 784. Um, and this is like tiny image. It's not even color image. It's black and white grayscale. So it doesn't have three channels. Uh, in color image, usually you have three channel, red, green, and blue. Um, and then if you have a four, 64 by 64 color image, so you have three channel, you will get an input uh, vector more than like 100,000. And that's just very small image and you already have that huge of an input vector. So you can expect the number of parameters will grow very fast and it will soon be difficult to get enough data to fit the model, right? So also as input image size grows, the computational requirements to train feed forward neural network will soon become infeasible. Um, you ask, many people ask about the number of layers. Um, it's really expensive. Once you have, if you have a lot of data uh, and it's actually very expensive to add more layers. So there's a physical limitation of how much you can compute. So the computation uh, requirement uh, will get so big that make it impossible. Also after vectorization, you lose the most special information from the image. That's the relation, uh, spatial relation among the pixel. Um, to overcome this, people instead of, uh, instead of using the convolution neural network for computer vision problem. So um, the computer vision has been advancing rapidly, uh, which enable many new application like self-driving cars and uh, unlocking a form using your face. Um, and the application is not application is not limited to the tech industry. Um, and in the, the first company I work, that's DuPalm, I work in the agriculture site. Uh, they use convolutional network for precision agriculture where they use the advanced hardware and computer vision algorithm to increase the efficiency and reduce costs for farmers by uh, taking taking the picture from satellite for the land um, to tell the farmers how much nitrogen you will need for that specific field. Um, so that's that there has been a lot of uh, research around that area and, and fascinating uh, application there. Um, and also there's a lot of uh, application in um, medical areas to help clinicians to diagnose disease, identify cancer sites uh, with high accuracy. 
even you don't work on computer vision, you may find some of the idea will be uh, inspiring and, and fascinating. So there are some popular computer vision problem. Um, the first one is image classification. Uh, that's the image recognition. That's the most common one and used the most. Uh, it's to recognize an object in the image. Like, is it a, there is is there a cat uh, in the image or not? Uh, that's the most naive case. And then um, uh, in medical world, it, you can identify is there a cancer site in the image or not? Um, and object detection um, is more complicated than just image classification because you don't you you not only need to detect the specific object you also need to know the border you you need to know there is an object there that's first step you also need to know where is the object you need to know the border uh, of like you have a car in front of you uh, you need to know how far away your car to the car in front of you um, so that's that's what's used in the self driving car um, and then the third type is neural style transfer. So you have a content image and you have a style image and you generate an image that merge these two with this type of content um, and has that specific style. So that's computer vision. We will uh, go through the foundation of uh, different type of layers in um, in convolutional network and then for the hands-on, we will work on the image classification problem. So we already know this black and white image data uh, and for a color image, so you have three channels, red, green, blue. Um, if you use feed forward, you vectorize it, but um, it's better to use convolutional neural network because it's more efficient way uh, to work on image data. Uh, and then, you will take this convolutional neural network can keep the input shape without vectorizing them. Uh, you just take all three channels as uh, three channels as they are, and work on it. Uh, first, let's look at uh, the most important layer, uh, convolution layer. What is a convolution? So, a convolution layer function in this way is assuming you have an input image like on the left. Okay, and you have a kernel. Um, just assume you know the value of the kernel. It's one zero one zero one zero one zero one. So you know this kernel value, and you convolute over this input image, and then you have an output image. How do you convolute over? You basically stack this kernel on top of the input image, um, and you do element-wise multiplication, and you move forward one step each time. In this case. Um, so you see it shrimps in size um, as you convolute over this image. Uh, you, you, st you start with a five by five matrix and use a three by three kernel. You move one step each time, you will get a three by three output image. Hope it's clear how you convolute over. Uh, it just, you just stack this kernel up. You can see the bottom uh, plot, the image. So you stack this up and you do element-wise multiplication and you add it up. Uh, so you get four on the lower right here. Um, that's how you get the convoluted feature. So that's the most important convolution. Some intuition behind the convolution, how you detect different feature. So different, different filter uh, intends to detect different feature from the image. And when you do activation function, move forward, you basically com combine more naive and simple feature to be more complicated feature um, as it goes deeper into the uh, neural network. Um, this is an example of vertical edge detection. Um, so since we already know what type of filter would be able to detect the vertical edge. So this type of one the first column is one, the second column is zero, the third column is negative one. And you can do two and zero or negative two, uh, that will also detect the edge. Uh, the key is you have um, the first column and the third column, they cancel out. Um, um, and in this filter, if you filter over the original picture, you can actually, the, the bottom one is actually visualize this picture. So you put this matrix uh, in R or in Python, and I think you can find package to visualize it. Uh, and this is how, how the input look like, it's the bottom one. So you can see the, the 
white strip, um, um, gray strip. Or if if it's positive, it's it's white. If it's zero, it's gray. It's negative. It's black. In this, um, in this grayscale matrix. And then once you convolute using this, uh, this type of filter, uh, you will end up light up the vertical edge. When there's a color change, you will light up that part. Uh, this is the picture. This is the original picture. And this is uh, the middle one This after you implement this vertical edge detection filter over this picture. So you can see all the vertical line kind of light up. Uh, similarly, you can actually do horizontal edge detection. So what you will do will flip it uh, by 90% um, clockwise. And then you use that filter to filter over horizontal. You will detect the horizontal edge. Um, so here is the this part of the book um, has the detailed code of um, just have some hypothetical matrix and visualize the matrix uh, and convolute over uh, the, the sample. And also it has code of uh, reading an image. You can change the link of the image and read any image you want and apply vertical and, and uh, horizontal kernel. This is what you will get. Um, yeah, this is the input and output image um, and the kernel visualization. So you can try it yourself. Hope this will give you some intuition behind different filter. And it gets more complicated that you can't always know what it detect uh, by, by looking at the filter. You, um, you can sort of guess what it detect by visualizing it um, after the filter. So in this case, what are the parameters? The parameters are the value in this kernel. Um, in this example, the kernel is this three by three filter. Um, so we have nine parameters. So you have input image, you do convolution layer, and you have to end up to be four by four. You move one step each time. Um, so you get four by four, basically six minus three plus one. Uh, if you do one step each time. So that's one of the um, important layer. Um, that's the convolution layer in your network, in convolutional neural network. Another important layer is padding layer. So assuming you have a strike one, uh, you will shrink it. Um, you will shrink site and you use three by three kernel. You, you will shrink uh, the size by two each time. Um, so if you go multiple steps, you will soon run out of space. You can't, you can't continue um, building new layers, convolution layers. So that's one of the reason that people pad the, the output to keep the size the same as the input size. And also there is another reason that you might use padding is that um, it might overlook some information in the image in the edge. Uh, if you don't have padding, um, so it will overlook some of the in information in the corner that you won't get. So padded can help you get information in the corner. But padding layer doesn't introduce uh, extra, um, in, uh, extra parameter. It doesn't, it's not like the filter. Filter has parameter, padding doesn't, you just pad zero. And now we have uh, introduced uh, the most important layer, convolution layer, and then uh, we have the uh, input image size. We have, we need to decide the filter size. And then uh, you can decide if it, you need to use padding or no padding. And then another thing you can decide is the stripe uh, size. You can move one step or two step each time. Okay, so if you use two steps each time, it will shrink faster after the convolution. It will shrink faster. So here's just the equation, uh, the relationship between the output size uh, and the, the padding and filter size and the stripe. Uh, strike number. So now we have um, talked about how to convolute over one channel. 
uh, that's black and white. We have been working on black and white so far. Uh, what, what about image, uh, picture with image? So if you convolute over the picture of image, basically what you do is you have each filter, you need to have multiple channels um, because the input has multiple channels. Uh, this is not three. If you look at the yellow part, it's not three filters. It's one filter, but it's it's three. It, the filter has three channels because you have to match the, the number of channel in the input. So the input has three channel channels. So the filter need to have three channels. That's one filter, and then you convolute over. Uh, you you convolute channel by channel. So the first channel in the filter will convolute over the red. The second will convolute over. Uh, green, the third will convolute over blue. And once you convolute over, assume you have one step each time. Uh, stripe is one, and then you will get four, four by four, and then you add it up. So you can imagine that as it's it's trying to detect some type of feature. Um, you might want this step to detect different type of feature, and then you can combine those features together to further uh, define a uh, more complicated feature. For example, you might want horizontal edge detection, and then you want also a vertical edge detection, then you can further combine horizontal and a vertical and to have like an angle or things like that. Um, so that's why you usually use multiple uh, filters uh, on each step. So here we have two filters, but the orange one uh, also has the same uh, size, three by three by three, and, and then you will get another four uh, by four. And then this output will have two um, filters um, in this step. So here's a very nice video, YouTube video, to show you the uh, how it steps. So you can see this is how it convolute over well, one filter, and the filter size uh, will have the number the number of channel will match the the number of channel in in the input. And then you have the second filter, you filter over, you have, uh, you add different channel up after. Yep, so this is how it works for um, over volumes, more than one channel. So now the question is, um, how many parameter you will introduce uh, using this convolution over volume? Um, so if you have 10 filters, and each filter is three by three by three um, in one layer of the new network, how many parameter does that layer have? Uh, you can think about it yourself. So you have 10 filters, each has three by three by three, that's 27, um, 27 parameters. And then you have 10 of those, so it's 270. And then for each of that, you will need one bias turn. So you have 10 of this B1, that's one, one value. So you have 270 plus 10, so you have 280 um, for this, this type of layer. Okay. So then there's another type of layer called pooling layer. Uh, people sometimes use this pooling layer to reduce the size of the presentation and make some of the feature detection more robust. Um, so if you have this four times four input, um, the max and min pooling operation are, um, are in this way. So for the max pooling, you just have, um, you separate this to by, uh, if, if you pull by filter size two and strike size two, so basically you separate this input to be four, two by two, and you just get maximum number of each of them. And then um, if you use mean pooling, you use the mean of this uh, subregion from the input. Uh, I think that's very straightforward. And, and pooling layer doesn't introduce any parameter either. It's like the padding layer. It's a way to facilitate, but it doesn't introduce extra um, parameter. So here's an example of input image. So top left is the original input image. Uh, top right is I convert this image to be black and white. Uh, and then just make it easier to visualize. So, and then black and white, you just do, you do two, you do one is max pulling and the other is mean pulling on the bottom. Can you guess 
which one is the uh, the result of max pooling, which one is the result of mean pooling, just by um, thinking about what we do here for max and pool, uh, and, and can you tell which one is max, which one? Max on the right, mean on the right, <laughs> okay. Um, actually, the, the max is on the left. So max is kind of pick out the most distinct point. It really doesn't matter which one is the just most distinct point. Um, so, um, and mean will make it blurry, uh, just blend into the background. Smoothing, yeah, exactly smoothing effect due to mean. Um, so the the right is is mean pulling. Um, so you can you if you are interested you can get your own picture and try it here. Uh, so I have all the uh, this is a function for max and mean. Uh, and um, this is to read the image, this package, read the image, resize it, uh, and then um, you run the polling and then you apply that to your own picture to see um, how it works on your picture. So, so far we already uh, introduced very important concept of um, different type of layers. Um, so we have convolution layer, we have polling layer, we have fully connected layer. Uh, that's fully con connected layer is the, um, what we introduced before, that's a feed forward new network. Now we will uh, look at how we can put all this together. Uh, we go over some of the classic um, convolution new network. So you have the idea of how people design different structure. I think the best way to learn about what should be the right structure is just to go over all the classic and successful structures uh, that will give you an idea of how people uh, built the structure. And when you go through many of them, you can actually find some pattern that people use. So let's start from um, the very original Net5. Uh, this, is the, this is the neural network. It's the first success of uh, using convolution neural network in image data, make this type of model um, known to people. So the net five is very simple uh, comparing to today's convolutional network. The structure is very simple. Uh, and back then people used sigmoid uh, hyperbolic tension, but didn't use RALU. People didn't, at that time they haven't figured out um, RALU is a, is a better way yet. So they use sigmoid and, and hyperbolic tension and that actually make the optimization process harder. And plus there's no GPU at that time um, so that make it even harder to build deeper neural network. It's quite a success if you consider the computational um, environment at that time. Um, it's quite a success for uh, to have the net five. Basically, you have input that's a gray scale image, uh, thirty two by thirty two, and then you do a convolution neural network, uh, and then you shrink it by size. You can tell in from 32 by 32 to 28 by 28. Uh, and you can actually see, uh, you can actually tell the size of the, uh, the filter, it's five by five, right? Um, and then you convolute over uh, this input data and then, and then you have output shrinking size and you basically have six channels. You have six filters in this step. So that's why it has six at 28 by 28. Uh, it doesn't tell you the number of channel, but you can tell by the output size. And then after that, uh, you would do a subsampling. You can see subsampling means it's doing pulling. Usually after you pull, you shrink its size by half and you keep the number of filter. So it's still six filter. And then you do another convolution. So you do another convolution and subsampling. Uh, after this subsampling, you do fully connected. What do you do gonna be, uh, you vectorize everything. So you basically vectorize all this five by five by 16. Um, 
and then you vectorize all of this, you do fully connected layer. You, and the layer size is 120, that's 120 neuron. The fully connected is feed forward neural network, uh, what we talked about. And then you do another fully connection uh, and connect to the output. You can see the output here is still 10 um, because the, the digit, it's, it's the digit recognition, um, the handwritten digit. So uh, there are 10 categories. So you have to connect to the output to be 10. So this is the net five. Um, after that, um, another very classic uh, CNN is AlexNet. Uh, it works better than the net five. It's also more complicated. Uh, similar, this, this new network is similar to the net, uh, but much bigger. Uh, and also uh, another aspect of, of a special of this architecture is that um, it actually use ralu um, than sigmoid. So that make it much better than the net five. And also at that time, GPU is still very slow. Um, at that time, GPU exists just very slow. So they actually train the model across multiple GPU. Um, and you can see this uh, separation. You can see the separation. It's like the similar part uh, just separate to be two parts. It's because they spread it out to two different CPU. They actually design a, a structure to make it work across different CPUs. Um, but for each CPU, um, the, the process is, is basically the same for each CPU. Um, um, the original AlexNet, uh, this architecture also used something called uh, local response normalization, um, but it's not used very often now. It's basically, it basically looks at a position and get across one position and get across all channel and normalize them. Uh, the motivation behind that uh, is for each position um, in this image, you don't want too many neurons with very high activation, but many researchers find it's not that helpful. So people are not using that um, that much, but in terms of the structure it's still, um, it's deeper than the, uh, the net five um, and it works better um, it, because they use ReLU. And the VGG 16, uh, they have different versions. They have VGG um, 11, VGG 13, VGG 16, and VGG 19. Somehow VGG 16 is the one people uh, remember. Um, and this is, this. so from the net five, AlexNet is just getting more and more complicated in a way that uh, we add more uh, layers. Um, but for VGG 16, uh, the name refer to how many convolution layers you use. They have, there are 16 different layers um, it use. So that's why it's called VGG16. And you, it seems like it's very complicated with so many layers. It's actually VG16 is very simple structure because the, the block has specific pattern. It's very repetitive. Um, the way it stack up is the same. So you have, um, you have similar pattern, like you have convolution three and you get six, 64. So basically you have, um, each time you max pull, uh, you shrink it in size, but uh, you make it bigger. Um, so you get from, once you shrink it in size, you get, get from 64, um, 64 channels to be 128 channels. And you do another round of max pull, you shrink it in size, and you also at the same time make it deeper you get from 128 to 350, 356. And for the third one, you also you do another round max pull and then you, you do uh, more filters, you, you increase the depths. So you can see the pattern um, is very similar. And also within, within each building block, you can see this com comp three and 260, uh, 255. Within this block for each convolution layer, uh, it use padding to keep everything in the same size. So in terms of the height and width, it's always the same. It keeps uh, that the same. It just keep on making it deeper and deeper. Shrinking size and, and within each block, it's the same. And shrinking, shrink in size, 
and within each block, the size is the same. You can refer to the original paper of this design of this type of um, structure. So uh, the number of parameters is a lot. You can see the, um, in this different structure, you have 11, 13, 16, 19. Um, and the, for VGG 16, that's column D, we have 138 million parameters for this website, oh, for this, for this structure. But all these three from the Net5, um, AlexNet, and VGG16, they are all just getting more layers uh, without too much fundamental change other than having that um, like have GPU and use ReLU. Um, it's get deeper and more complex in structure, um, more parameters without changing the fundamental structure. Uh, and the rest net um, is the one that um, it's sort of groundbreaking comparing to the previous couple because it comes up the idea of skipping some uh, layers. Um, you, people ask about um, vanishing gradient uh, before. Um, as, I, as I said, as you, if you only have five layers, it's unlikely to be a big problem like the net five. Uh, but once you developed from the net five to Alex net to VG16, even 19, it started to be a problem that the earlier layers impact on the output will get, will, will vanish uh, as you add more layers. So how can you keep this information to somehow prevent this vanishing gradient problem? Um, that's where um, ResNet comes in. It proposed the idea of skip some of the layers. Uh, and if you have activation function, you skip two layers, you add this uh, activated neuron um, to this point. So, which also means you have to keep it the same size. You have to make sure you can add that um, result from this step, um, skip two step and add at this point. So basically, skip two step each time and add it forward, add it forward to adjust the 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 dense the 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 way information flows. Uh, so that's basically that's the idea of um, ResNet. So it's based on VGG nineteen, but it start to um, start to skip some of the the layers and add the value forward. So they call it a uh, residual block. So each one of this is residual block. Uh, we will go to the CM hands-on later. Uh, one thing I want to also share is the um, understanding your network. Um, there are two good video on understanding your network because your network gets too complex that it's a Black, black box is very hard to, for people to understand what's going on inside. So there's a branch of research, uh, try to understand neural network through visualization. It's a short video. That's... Recent advances in neural networks have enabled computers to better see and understand the world. They can recognize school buses and zebras and can tell the difference between Maltese Terriers and Yorkshire Terriers. We now know what it takes to train these neural networks well, but we don't know so much about how they're actually computing their final answers. We developed this interactive deep visualization toolbox to shine light into these black boxes, showing what happens inside of neural nets. In the top left corner, we show the input to the network, which can be a still image or a video from a webcam. These black squares in the middle show the activations on a single layer of a network, in this case, the popular deep neural network called AlexNet running in CAFE. By interacting with the network, we can see what some of the neurons are doing. For example, on this first layer, a unit in the center responds strongly to light dark edges. Its neighbor, one neuron over, responds to edges in the opposite direction, dark to light. 
Using optimization, we can synthetically produce images that light up each neuron on this layer to see what each neuron is looking for. We can scroll through every layer in the network to see what it does, including convolution, cooling, and normalization layers. We can switch back and forth between showing the actual activations and showing images synthesized to produce high activation. By the time we get to the fifth convolutional layer, the features being computed represent abstract concepts. For example, this neuron seems to respond to faces. We can further investigate this neuron by showing a few different types of information. First, we can artificially create optimized images using new regularization techniques that are described in our paper. These synthetic images show that this neuron fires in response to a face and shoulders. We can also plot the images from the training set that activate this neuron the most, as well as pixels from those images most responsible for the high activations, computed via the deconvolution technique. This feature responds to multiple faces in different locations. And by looking at the decon, we can see that it would respond more strongly if we had even darker eyes and rosier lips. We can also confirm that it cares about the head and shoulders that ignores the arms and torso. We can even see that it fires to some extent for cat faces. Using backprop or decon, we can see that this unit depends most strongly on a couple units in the previous layer con four and on about a dozen or so in CON3. Now let's look at another neuron on this layer. So what's this unit doing? From the top nine images, we might conclude that it fires for different types of clothing. But examining the synthetic images shows that it may be detecting not clothing per se, but wrinkles. In the live plot, we can see that it's activated by my shirt. And smoothing out half of my shirt causes that half of the activations to decrease. Finally, here's another interesting neuron. This one has learned to look for printed text in a variety of sizes, colors, and fonts. This is pretty cool because we never asked the network to look for wrinkles or text or faces. The only labels we provided were at the very last layer. So the only reason the network learned features like text and faces in the middle was to support final decisions at that last layer. For example, the text detector may provide good evidence that a rectangle is in fact a book seen on edge and detecting many books next to each other might be a good way of detecting a bookcase, which was one of the categories we trained the net to recognize. In this video, we've shown some of the features of the DeepViz toolbox and a few of the things we've learned by using it. You can download the toolbox of this URL and explore for yourself. If you'd like to share what you find, you can use the hashtag DeepViz. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to seeing what you discover. Yeah, this is, um, this is the visualization for the AlexNet um, that we showed before. So you can see how people try to understand uh, what it detects. It's not the, it, yeah, this is the AlexNet. Um, try to detect what each, what each layer and what each um, filter in that layer actually try to detect. Um, and you can see as it gets further, um, the what it can detect becomes more abstract from the very beginning specific edge um, to more complicated concept. Uh, that's how it evolved um, to the later layer. And also not every um, neuron will impact the later. Um, this, uh, they have backprop view of uh, what, what are the neurons that are actually fire signal to the later. It's actually very close to the way uh, human brain work if you think about it. Um, and another video um, is about the deep neural network that are easily fooled. I think it's, it's a very short video. It's super interesting on this. Um, we won't play that here due to the time, but I would recommend you to check out this video um, that how they can synthesize different uh, image to fool the neural network um, to make very ridiculous prediction for the image that uh, from human's point of view, uh, it's very easy to recognize, but um, the computer cannot predict it. Um, for the hands on, we have the convolution neural network R data breaks. So it's very similar. You copy paste this link. And 
you import import using URL. Similarly, you need to detect or you need to attack to the attach to the um the course the cluster you created. Ho hopefully your cluster is still all um it will turn it off if, if it's inactive for a certain time and it will take some time to reactivate uh recreate a cluster again. And also um what since you have already installed this uh this package as soon as you as soon as you still use the same cluster, um, it will not, see it's very fast. It won't repeat, it won't insert it again. So it saves some time. And the second the second cell like in, library cares the install backend will be very fast too. This time it only take like four seconds. It used to take about a minute uh, for this cell. It's much faster. And then similarly, as before, we will read the data. Uh -oh. We will read the data uh, and the data structure. We use the same data. Um, this time, we use convolutional neural network instead of feedforward neural network. And we save the we save the different object as before: x train, y x train, y train, x text, and y test. Uh, and then we need to define a few parameter that used in the CN model. We define the batch size, it's the same. Number of classes, um, and we reduce the app box to be 10 because it takes longer to run. Uh, we, we used 15 before, um, so we use 10 here. And for this um, CNN, since we need to take the input as it is, so we need to define the input image dimension. Uh, we are not using a color image here, so we still have one channel, but we have image row in the column is 28 by 28. We assign the row and the column, um, and then um, you need you still need data preprocessing, which is different uh, preprocessing. Uh, th in this situation, you make the data to be in shape. You need to have three dimensions. One is uh, the rows, columns, and also number of channel, even it's only one channel, you have to specific about uh, the shape. You have one channel because at it, as it moves on, it can have different number of channels uh, when you build different um, layer, add on different layers. If you have a color image, it will, uh, the input shape will be image row and column and three channels. So we can see this time the uh, training data, like X train, uh, the size would be, you have 60,000 training data, still the same, uh, but the size would be, it's not 784 after we shape, um, like before we vectorize it. Now it's a 128, 120, uh, 128, and then one, 28, 28, one um, array. And then we still need to scale it our uh, input to be between zero and one for the same reason for the numerical stability. And for y, it's the same. Uh, you, you change, you convert y uh, to be a categorical variable, um, uh, a summary variable. So each column will indicate um, each class. So the model fitting, um, the logic the syntax is very similar, um, but you are using different layer now. Um, so you still initialize the model using Keras model sequential. You add it up, so it's a sequence. Uh, and then you put it under CN model. And then you start to add layer. The first layer is comp layer uh, with filter size 32, uh, which means you will have uh, 32 channels for the next layer, right? You have 32 filters and the kernel size is 5.5. Five. Um, so, and the activation function, um, activation function uh, is ralu and input shape um, is the input shape you defined before. And then 
you, after that, you use max point. Um, so max point size of uh, the polling layer is usually uh, two by two, just so you shrink the size in half. Um, after polling, and you increase the number of filters um, in the next convolution layer uh, with kernel size the same. Uh, and then you do another round of max pouring so it gets smaller, even smaller. Uh, and then um, you have a dropout, uh, that dropout rate is 0 0.2. And then you flatten this before you get into the dense layer. That's a layer we used before. Uh, and then you have a new dropout, 0 0.5, and then uh, you have unit 84. Uh, and then um, you connect to the last layer. Um, so the units need to be the number of class activation functions softmax. You can, you can do similar, you can make similar model like the next five and see how it works. Uh, it will be very easy to um, create a structure like that using this syntax. Uh, I got to fail to create cluster requests. Yeah, if you are creating another cluster, um, it will sometimes give you an error because uh, in the backend, they probably still detect the previous cluster running. Uh, try to refresh, see if you can see the previous cluster. So my cluster is still running and I didn't really use it. So if you create a cluster before, it should still be running by now. Um, so you cannot create a new cluster. It's better not to because you already saved the, all the package and setting um, you ran last time in that cluster. So you don't need to spend extra time to do it again. So you can see the summary of CN model. You can, it's, it's very clear that how much um, parameter will, will be introduced by the dense layer, you see, um, the convolution layer has less parameter because one filter, use one filter, uh, that filter can go through all the image, all the channels. Um, and um, you don't, the, the size doesn't increase um, as the image size increases. The size, the number of parameter is also, is only related to the size of the filter, the kernel. It's not related to the size of input image. So that's, um, that's a good, way to control the number of parameter. If you go to the dense layer, you can see the number of parameters is much higher. And this is already closer to the output. That's why we can use dense layer. When, when it gets to the, closer to the output, you start to shrink it in size and try to make it, um, try to make it to be able to connect to the output. That's finally you will get to 10. Uh, that's the output size. And then after that, you will compile the model. Um, so you still use the same loss function because it's basically the same output. Um, and you use a different type of optimizer. You can change this uh, to be another optimizer, see how it works. Yeah. Um, and then the metric still accuracy. We want to use uh, that as a metric, yeah. accuracy metrics. Uh, and then after you compile the model, the CN model object has the model structure, loss function, optimizer you want to use and what you want to eva use to evaluate the model as accuracy. And then you can start to compile the model uh, when you, uh, you can start to fit the model. When you fit the model, you need to know uh, how many sample you will use to fit the model. That's a batch size here. A number of epochs, uh, we set it to be 10 here. Um, and validation split are uh, similar as before. That's the validation you will use within training data. It's not using a test, test data yet. And then it start to fit the model here. Uh, you can see the accuracy is, is higher. Than, even the previous one is already very high, but uh, convolutional networks accuracy is higher than the feed forward on this image data. It's getting to the 99% now. Even, even for the validation accuracy is about 99%. And then uh, you can evaluate it using test data. What's the accuracy in the test data? Uh, it's still 99%. So you didn't use test data before. So the test data is totally left out and that's a good way to evaluate the model. 
we see the accuracy is higher. And um, you can, all the history is saved in the object CN history, and you can plot uh, the CN history. If you want to customize your, your plot, uh, you can just get specific metrics. So you can actually get specific metrics here by uh, from the metric metrics object um, in CN history, and you get specific uh, metric to plot it the way you want. We just use the default function. It's easier here. And then you can, um, similarly, you can predict. Um, if you want to know like under the hood, how, how the, the model uh, actually predicts specific class, um, again, if you go to the step-by-step, -step, it will be uh, very clear if you run through this example. Uh, there's a function called prediction. Uh, we actually use a function to predict the. So the prediction basically you have the forward propagation, right? And you get X in all the parameter, you will get value between zero to one. Basically, you just try to find the location where, which one is the maximum and you return the location. So that's how it gets the prediction. You return the location of the, each column. Maximum value of each column. Yes, yeah, similarly, you can see the uh, misclassification. I think for CNN, the, the image that's, when it gets to this point, um, the accuracy is that high, the misclassified image are, those image are confusing to to human too, like this one. Um, if if you if you just let me look at it, I wouldn't know. Um, it's three. I probably will also say it's five. And you can try another one. So it's digit seven. Yeah, I will certainly think it's two or. I don't know, I wouldn't think it's seven. Um, so you can see some of the misclassified one, it's really not about the model. It's the image itself is, is very not clear. Oh, this one is more reasonable. I would, I would know it's five um, if you let me guess it. But still, you can say it's six in some way in shape. So yeah, those are the C and hope you can run the notebook uh, and you can build your own structure. You can follow the structure we talked about today. Um, try to replicate those structure using um, the net, the next five and Alex net. This two, the next and Alex net. Um, see what you get. So let's go to the. go to the Python notebook. Um, oh, we also have the R local version, um, it's very similar code. So similar, if you want to run the Python notebook, um, you can open in Colab uh, and you should just be able to run just by uh, shift, shift return and you do run anyway. Um, Okay, um, it's the layer structure is actually very much easier um, in Python. You can see um, it's very straightforward. Um, and then um, the reshape data, you, you, you reshape it uh, in a similar way to be similar to what you do here in R to make it um, an array of 28, 28, and one. So that's basically what you do here. You will shape it to be um, 28 by 28 by one. And you have the number of image. This is the number of image. Uh, this is number of image. The first value is number of image. And we shape it. Okay. Any questions before we move on to the RN? Now let's move 
um, to the last part of RN. So RN is used for the sequential data. Um, so the fit board is kind of the, the foundation of um, both CN and RN and CN is for the image data um, and RN is for the sequential data, uh, mainly for text. Um, what is sequential data is if you think about speech recognition, you have the audio clips and you want to recognize the speech from the, the audio. Um, so that's a sequence of data. Like I'm talking right now, um, all the words is a sequence. And also music generation is another example of sequence data. Uh, sentiment classification, that's a common use case. Um, that's when you have, when you read uh, a review and you classify it as a uh, positive or negative review. Uh, so that's sentiment uh, classification. Um, and the video activity recognition, name entity recognition is another one uh, common in natural language processing is you read a sentence, you want to recognize the name entity uh, from that uh, sentence. Like here, Netify and Hugo are two name entities uh, from that sentence. So in terms of structure, um, RN and structure is more, is, is not, um, it's more flexible. Uh, it has different size of input and output. It's not like, in that case, it's, it's, not, it's not like CN feed forward. It, it can be more flexible in terms of the structure. Um, and there are some common types, ignore the one-to-one -one that uh, that's not same anywhere. Um, you can get one too many. Um, so it's like the music generation. You have uh, you start with one constant or even just empty nothing, and you start to generate things uh, based on the an initial value. Uh, so that's one too many. Um, and one many to one is the uh, it's the example of um, sentiment analysis. You read a review and you have a prediction on the sentiment of the review, that's many to one. And for all this plot, um, you can see the green rectangle, it means an input vector. Um, and all the rectangle, blue, red, and uh, a green, green, red, and, and blue, uh, those rectangles are all vectors. and green one is the input vector, and then you get to red, it's, it's intermediate state. Um, it's intermediate state, and then blue one is the output vector. And each arrow means a matrix multiplication. Um, so after the multiplication, you get a new vector. Um, so that's the representation here. Uh, and then you have many to many. Uh, many to many, there are two types of many to many structure. Uh, one is the, the input and the output need to have the same size. For example, for the entity recognition, name entity recognition, um, you need to have the same size input and output because for each word, you have to notate it as like an entity yes or no, right? Um, another many to many is like machine translation or even video clip. Uh, those are many to many, it doesn't have to be the same size because different language may use different number of words to represent the same meaning. So when you translate uh, from one language to another, uh, the size may differ. So we will use the um, many to many, the same size, uh, the name recognition as an example to explain the recurrent neural network. So if you have this sentence, use Netify and Hugo um, as an input, and your goal is to, um, to get the entity of uh, each word, to identify which word is an entity, like use as a verb, it's not an entity, it's zero. So Netify, it's an entity name, it's company name, so it's one. Uh, Hugo is a static, stat, uh, static website uh, generator, um, and then it's one, it's an entity name. So that's, that will be your uh, response. Um, and for 
in RN, this is just one input. Um, each input has different word. So it, this is one sentence. And then for each sentence, you can have uh, the length of the sentence. That's uh, the TXI here. That's I sample. But for I sample, you have uh, the sentence length. And accordingly, you have TY. I. And then the first thing you need to do is to represent words. It's like the image. You need to represent the image in numbers. Uh, so that's similar for uh, recurrent neural network. You need to represent the words. Um, we will start from one hot encoding. Uh, that's the naive way of doing it. Uh, we, it's not used in practice um, just for illustration purpose. We, we assume we use this one hot encoding to encode each word to be a vector. Um, and um, basically you just, you can have the word bank. The word bank can be from uh, just general words people use, the most common 10,000 words people use, or it just, you can use the top 2,500 words in your training data and use that as your word bank. And then you can convert each of the uh, word you have to be a, to be a vector with length 25,000. Uh, in this case, we have 10,000 words, potential words, and you will convert it to be a dummy variable uh, with the location indicator location of, of the word. Um, and that location would be one. So it will be a huge vector. Um, and then um, after that, you can start to uh, build the model. So you will initialize an original state that's A0, uh, and then initialize S0, and then you put that in, you basically pick up information at each point of time. You start to get uh, Xi, uh, and then you, you get information from the left, that's the previous state uh, at the X1, so you get information from A0. Uh, there's nothing there, so it's, it's zero, basically zero. And then you have the current word, you read the first word that's use. And so you read that word, uh, that's a vector. Uh, and then you do a linear combination of that vector, uh, that's WAX. Here we uh, create four neurons uh, in that layer, that's four neurons. So um, you will do linear combination four times. Uh, and then you have the WAX and then you plus the bias term BA and then you get the, you get the, non-activated neuron. So you just get a linear combination and you need to activate it to get A1. And in this case, you also need to connect to the output. It really depends on the structure of the specific neural network you are building. Uh, you, sometimes you need to produce output. In this case, you need to have output. Uh, in other case, you don't. Um, so you need to have an output uh, Y1 here. Um, so the output will be, um, you. The output will be, you get the A1, that's activation function, and you do another uh, activation to connect to the output. Uh, that's Y1 hat. And then for the, since you still need to carry the information forward to the left or to the right to pick up uh, more words. Um, so you will still use this A1, uh, not just to calculate the Y1 hat, you also need to carry over the information and then pick up the next words. Uh, and then um, you do a linear combination, uh, and a new linear combination considered a new piece of information you have uh, and calculate the next state. And then you move forward. So you move upward, uh, connect to the output, and you move right um, to go to the next state. And then in this case, the loss function is the same because it's zero one, you still use entropy. Um, as loss function. And then um, you have y hat. y hat would be a number between zero to one. You use sigmoid uh, for that last layer, uh, for the output layer. And then um, you calculate the y hat, you calculate the distance between y hat and y. Um, and then um, you add it up. In this case, you don't average over, you don't divide it by ty. Uh, you basically add it up because you do the, it's different prediction. So that, that is the forward. Um, so you go from input uh, to calculate the loss. And then backward will be similar. You get from the loss uh, all the way 
back propagate the information um, and um, update the parameter in a similar way, do backward propagation. In recurrent neural network uh, from left to right, it's not different layers, so it's, it's the structure is different. The layer means from bottom to up. So the layer means the, the layer between input and output. So in this structure representation, uh, the layer is from bottom to up. Here we have three layers. And then um, um, for recurrent neural network, if we have a long sentence um, from left to right here, not, not bottom to up, if we have a long sentence from left to right, even we don't have that many layers, we only have one, even just one layers, we can have a very long sentence. Uh, so we will still have the vanishing gradient problem in this situation, um, which means the word at the beginning um, information will lose uh, will, over time um, when it gets to the later of the sentence. But sometimes we want to remember the word before, we think before, uh, we want to be able to capture that information and use it uh, sometime later on. So there are different mechanisms uh, that's designed for um, for this vanishing gradient problem. Um, so some of the traditional one, uh, LSTM and um, the gated uh, RN, uh, those are the traditional ones. They are new method, uh, more advanced method. Uh, people use BERT um, for the embedding. Um, so there are different new method that can uh, handle this problem but LSTM is a very classic one that was used um, a lot like years ago. So the idea of LSTM um, is you have, um, you set up different gates. Um, so you don't just take the new information, uh, pick up from the, the current, uh, current word, when you read the current word, uh, you actually, have a set up a gate and that gate will be the one to decide uh, tune between how much information you want to keep from the previous step uh, and how much information you want to update based on the current step. Uh, so this uh, this F, this sigma is sigmoid function. So the, because we want it to be a value between zero, zero to one, um, that's the gate. So that's always think about like a probability value. So you have a forget gate. Um, so that's a that's a probability. And then you similar, you have an update gate. Um, and you use very similar, uh, you, you use the activated neuron and the current state um, word like XT um, and to get update gate, use, use similar information to get forget gate. And then you don't just, in the previous uh, setting, you basically uh, have this linear combination and you, act, you activated this to get the next state uh, activated neuron. But um, in, when you have this gate, you don't just use the value, you basically use a combination. Uh, you put this under C tilde, so you hold it. You don't just use that yet. Uh, you actually update uh, the real CT to be a combination between C tilde, uh, that's used the current XT and the previous CT minus one. Uh, that's why this is called forget gate because the forget gate is multiplied, um, it's multiplied to the previous state. So basically it's the part of the information you forget about the current state, you use the previous state. An update would be the information you get from the current uh, XT, the new C tilde and you get a new uh, CT here. And then you use the new CT um, for the, uh, the current step activation function. Uh, and you have a wave, one more uh, output gate, that's gamma zero um, to decide the information you want to output, the percentage information you want to output. So this is structure that, um, that gate, the information um, to mitigate the vanishing gradient um, problem. 
So, so far we use the uh, we use the one hot encoding as a way to illustrate how we multiply those factors, what the structure is like, uh, how how we encode the data into uh, the words into numbers um, in real application um, we don't use one hot representation because obvious reason that the one hot encoding can be very long the vector can be very long and also the vector doesn't really represent the um, the relationship among the words so you can have word like men women but it, the it's the zero one basically indicate the location uh, where that word locate in uh, whatever word bank you use. It doesn't uh, tell you actual information about the relationship of the word, uh, the meaning of the word, semantic meaning, a semantic uh, relation of the words. Um, so instead of using one hot encoding, there are different way uh, to represent words um, called, the, one of the popular ones called different embedding. Uh, embedding so for example, if you have a sentence, um, my favorite Christmas dessert is pumpkin um, pie in your training data, and you would like to be able to deduct that. If you see another sentence, my favorite Christmas dessert is apple, you will say, you will know uh, it also should be a pie in a very high probability, right? Um, so you need to, in order to do that, you need to know more about uh, the relation amount um, those different words, pumpkin and apple in some way, they are all related to food. So here's the idea behind the word embedding is to instead of just using the location, you use the, the feature, you try to capture the feature of different words. We don't know what are those features. You can assume some of the feature. It's like it's like the factor analysis in statistics. So you do when you do factor analysis, you don't actually know what are those factors. You basically just get a set of number of factors that can best represent uh, the word, explain the variance. Um, that's basically what it does. And then in order to know what are those factors in stats, you, when you do factor analysis, you will go back to look at uh, what, what's what variable contribute to that factor and then um, try to explain what is that factor. Uh, so it's very similar here. We, you can define how many features you want, you want to extract from the words, but you don't know what exactly are those features, which here just for explanation, we assume there's a feature called gender. And now you just basically um, represent the word in terms of this feature. Okay, what's the score of this word according to this feature? So men, maybe it's positive or negative one and women, uh, it's positive one. So you can see the relation between men and women will be the opposite in terms of gender. And similar to king and queen, it will be the opposite uh, in terms of gender. And apple and pumpkin, they are food, they have they're not so related to gender. So maybe the score is very small. So that's the idea of a uh, fictionalized uh, representation. So what do you do is you, you define the number of features. For example, you want to detect 200 features and then or 300 features. And then the, the algorithm will learn uh, the, the most possible likely um, score according to different features that can represent capture the relationship among those words based on how often those words happen together you can use different like skip brand and and how how those words happen or locate in different sentence and how they uh, how they uh, relate to each other so in this way you for each for each uh, word you will have a much shorter vector. You don't have 10,000 or 2,500, depending on how many words you have. Um, it's the size is decided by how many feature you want to detect. Usually it will be 100 or 200. Um, so here we have 300 features. And then you can use this feature um, to represent the word. And then it will be a much easier question to answer um, if we have those featured uh, representation. For example, if you want, you have men versus women and 
king versus something. You want to get the word that can represent similar uh, relation um, that uh, men versus women uh, represent. So how do you do that? You basically try to find a vector that the vector's distance, the distance between um, king and, and, and the word will be similar to men and women. So you will find the word uh, representation of all the vectors. You try to find, um, so you will, will find E for men, the, the embedding for men, embedding for women, and then you find embedding for kin, and then you basically start to move this around. You try to maximize the similarity uh, of this, uh, the vector in the left and the vector in the right. So it will, it's transformed into a pure mathematical problem now, right? Um, and you can use um, cosine similarity in this situation. It has the direction and also the magnitude to capture the direction of the vector and the magnitude of the vector. And try to find a vector that can capture, that has the highest similarity. Um, so those are the basic idea of embedding. Um, and the most popular um, embedding right now currently um, is to use BERT. Um, you, can, you can search for BERT, B-E-R-T, um, and I think Google open source uh, many of those BERT uh, model. So you can, you can call the, the API and just use the BERT embedding um, in your research. So, it bird has a uh, different level of embedding right now. So this is we are talking about the word embedding. It also has sentence embedding. So you will if you want to understand the whole paragraph, like class, you you want to you want to uh, cluster uh, different paragraphs, and then you can do embedding for each sentence, um, and then you can summarize the the sentence to be the paragraph, for example. Um, so there's a sentence level embedding based on the meaning. So basically each sentence, you can think of it as each sentence capture different uh, features. And for the data per processing, so one thing that's different from um, this recurrent neural network uh, versus the traditional um, NLP based on the word frequency is you don't necessarily need to um, remove stop words. Um, and because the, the way it captures the meaning, consider the location of the word. Um, so if you, if you remove stop words, sometimes it can change the meaning of the sentence. Uh, there's some example here, uh, like I didn't like the product. If you remove didn't and you move I, and it would be like product. Um, so if you just use word, word count, that's why the, um, the sentimental analysis um, sometimes can be inaccurate if you just use the word count because you will count like as, um, as positive instead of didn't like, uh, that's actually a negative. Um, so you don't necessarily need to remove the stop words in this. So in terms of data processing for um, recurrent neural network, uh, you will read the data as raw text uh, and then the first step is you need to tokenize all the all the words to be different number. Uh, so you basically use the the first step is you just count that you can take the most frequent three thousand words in your uh, training set, and then you can order the word by the frequency, and then you just use the order the rank to indicate different um, words. So you basically can transform the sentence to be a number of um, a number, a list of number. And then for those, you can, if you use the top like 3000, if a word drop out of that range, you can have a new token like out of that or out of range, um, out of vocabulary um, token. So that will indicate, you can use number zero or something to indicate it's, a, uh, it's out of range. And then, Usually you will pat and truncate um, just to make the, the feeling easier. So you, you can define how many words you want to 
take um and you then you can make sure all the input are the same size uh so if the sentence is shorter so for example you want six the length of six and then if the sentence is shorter than six the first like this first sentence you just keep the first four uh and you pat you pat uh the later as zero and then like second sentence uh is longer than six you just keep the first six um so um so similar you can pat and truncate all the input sentence that's how you, you um if if you read the data in the notebook the data is already pre-processed so if you read the data as the number um here's how it's processed uh, to be um number so if you have text data you need to go through this process yourself okay yep i think that's all about i know it's a lot of content um the the goal of this course is to give you uh, the fun some foundation so you can have the um, enough knowledge to to learn further by yourself.